All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you may be in the world. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm a senior analyst at the Global Blockchain Business Council. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the GBBC Virtual Members Forum. This is a bi-weekly webinar series we host with our members around the world to showcase their innovative work and projects and give you all an inside look into their work. Today, we have the pleasure to be joined by Digital Asset. Uh, we have Beth Sendra, Director of Client Experience for the Americas, and Levy Barsi, uh, Client Engineer, for an introduction into DAML, which is an open source and platform independent smart contract language uh, that enables developers to uh, write an application once and deploy it anywhere. Before I hand things over to Beth and Levy, uh, I'd like to briefly introduce them. So Beth was one of Digital Asset's first employees joining prior to their launch in 2014. Uh, before then, she spent nearly three years as head of business development. Uh, before Digital Asset, she was an editor for Derivatives Publication and extensively reported on the financial markets for Derivatives Week Global Capital, Derivatives and Institutional Investor. And Levy is a computer scientist on the sales team. He has worked as a consultant in capital markets for over 15 years, particularly in the areas of credit risk and collateral management. And prior to digital asset, he worked as a subject matter expert at Murex. We welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar. You can share them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll take them after uh, Beth and Levy present. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to our presenters. Thanks so much. Awesome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much uh, to the GBBC for hosting us. We're very excited to be here. Um, without further ado, we will uh, share our screens and kick off with a little bit of background about digital asset, who we are, um, what DAML is, and then we will uh, turn it over to a a demo, a little interactive demo, and talk through some, some demo, exactly. So just a brief uh, history of Digital Asset to kick off with. Um, we were founded in 2014 with the vision of bringing blockchain solutions to, to enterprises. Um, in 2015, we made uh, our second acquisition with a company called Hyperledger. Um, it was the, the first permission blockchain without a native cryptocurrency. And shortly after that, we were one of the founding members of the Hyperledger project where we donated the brand name along with a bunch of code um, to co-create the Hyperledger project under the governance of the Linux Foundation. Um, this was with the common goal of sort of driving adoption and standardization of DLT and, and blockchain solutions. Uh, over the years, we've joined and continue to be members of a variety of organizations, in, including the Global Blockchain Business Council. Um, that are dedicated to furthering the adoption of blockchain. Uh, we believe organizations like this are, are vital uh, for us all to be able to harness the power of new technologies across a variety of different industries. Um, in 2016, we closed a uh, Series A uh, of 70 million, um, raising money from a, a variety of investors across uh, some of the world's largest financial institutions, technology companies, consultancies, we are now a Series C company and have raised around $150 million. Um, in 2016, we made our fourth acquisition. Um, this was with a Zurich-based company called Elevance, which were the uh, original creators of DAML. Um, DAML stands for the Digital Asset Modeling Language, and we will get into what that is uh, uh, in a little bit, but at its heart, it is an open source smart contract language. Uh, in 2017, uh, after nearly two years of working with us on a prototype, the Australian Securities Exchange selected DA and DAML to replace its core uh, settlement system for cash equities. That was and probably still is um, the most significant DLT based project in the world. And when we go live, if you trade a stock in Australia, it will clear, settle, net and be registered on a DAML driven application. In 2018, we continued our work with um, some of the large market infrastructures around the world. Um, one example being the Hong Kong Exchange, who selected DA to work on a post-trade allocation and settlement platform um, for northbound trading under their Stock Connect program. Um, we also opened our, our, an office in Hong Kong that year, increasing our global presence. And um, we actually continue to work with other MIs in that region. Uh, earlier this week, the Singapore Exchange announced that it had used DAML to successfully complete um, its first digital bond issuance. Last year was a big year for us. We decided to open source DAML. Um, this was a decision that was deliberated on over some time. It was a tough decision. 
um, but we thought that it would help accelerate the adoption of the technology and um, really provide customers with choices, which we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit. And last year, we also launched Project Dabble, which we're going to see shortly, um, our cloud platform that we um, are going to go through in more detail. But firstly, um, what do we actually do at DA? Um, our mission really is to change the way that distributed applications are built and deployed for our customers. Um, if you sort of think about uh, 20 years ago and how many developers it took to build a website, um, and today, you know, they say a 12 year old can do it in a couple of hours. Um, we kind of, we want to bring that sort of innovation to this space, but without compromising things like integrity and privacy, um, and also focusing on connectivity and interoperability to really uh, enable clients to deliver value to their customers. So if we, if we go to the next slide, um, what are the problems that we are trying to solve? Um, a lot of development work today is undifferentiating, but I guess what do we mean by that? Um, a significant amount of time is spent writing code that is necessary just to make the application work, and there's no real upside to the client. It's just a sort of tax they have to pay. Um, additionally, there's a lot of disparate and independent implementations which prevent that sort of interoperability and portability. Um, the reason for this is that the code that you write is so uh, closely coupled to the underlying infrastructure that it's very difficult and or costly to port the application over to another type of infrastructure. Um, the result of this is that innovation is expensive, it encourages vendor lock-in, and uh, it often results in these sort of multi-year migration efforts. So how do we solve this? Enter DAML. Uh, as mentioned earlier, DAML is an open source smart contract language um, that we developed, which is purpose built for writing complex multi party workflows. Um, DAML enables you to decouple that business logic uh, layer from the infrastructure layer and uh, provides a number of benefits when you're writing applications. So uh, it's very concise. Uh, with DAML, you can quickly prototype use cases focusing on that business logic and not the infrastructure. Um, and we'll, we'll show what we mean when we say concise in a little bit. Um, it's efficient. You can uh, very easily deliver the highest level of security and privacy without having to write additional code. Um, it's fit for purpose. And um, when we say that, we mean that it's designed for multi-party systems. It is also asset class and industry agnostic. It is being used uh, outside of financial services across a variety of other areas. Um, it's portable, DAML applications work across multiple platforms, um, and it is interoperable. So uh, you can atomically connect uh, DAML apps together. Um, and because DAML really abstracts away those complexities associated with the underlying infrastructure, it really allows the developer to focus on that business logic. Um, they, never, they no longer have to write that undifferentiating code that I was talking about um, that is before um, thinking about how they would deploy that on a specific persistence layer. So what do we actually mean when we say DAML is portable and how do we prove that out? Go to the next slide, perfect. So um, DAML is already available on a variety of uh, databases, distributed ledgers, managed services, and other platforms. Um, we also have a, a host of other platforms in the pipeline that will be coming soon. Uh, what this really means is that you can write your application once and then select the infrastructure that best fits your needs. Uh, historically, you would have to first select where you were going to deploy that application before you even began to develop and test the viability of your use case. So if you wanted to deploy your application on one DLT, you would have to write the application specific to that underlying ledger. But if you build in DAML, um, the beauty is that you can deploy it to a ledger of your choosing, but also uh, easily migrate or port that application in the future to another technology should your requirements or needs change without having to rewrite that code. So this becomes very powerful um, because there are some companies that just want to get the benefits of smart contracts and run that application on a regular database today, but tomorrow they may want to shift to DLT and also gain the benefits there. Um, so with DAML, you can really easily do that without having to uh, rewrite any of that code. 
So, you know, when we're looking at the goals and, and efforts of organizations like GBBC next to the goals of many new technologies like DLT and smart contracts, um, they're very much aligned. You know, we want, we're looking to reduce inefficiency and increase innovation and ensure interoperability. We're all kind of looking to do the same thing. And, and to us, a digital asset, enabling smart contracts to run on different platforms is the first step in driving that interoperability piece. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so where and how is Daml being used? If you go to Daml.com, uh, we actually have a complete marketplace of around 50 different applications, uh, many of which are actually open source. So you can go there today, download them, start building upon them, extending them. Um, and, and leveraging them as, as you wish. Uh, we also have many, many partners who are DAML enabled um, and building their own applications, which can also be found there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, DAML is industry and asset class agnostic. So uh, we're seeing it being used in capital markets, supply chain, healthcare, and some really cool uh, use cases, which you can take a, take a look at. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Levy to actually demonstrate some of these things I've been saying, uh, just to make sure I wasn't actually making anything up. And we can kind of see what we were talking around um, DAML properties around it being concise, the portability, and, and how we sort of abstract away some of those underlying complexities. Um, and we'll also talk about DAML, our uh, cloud offering. Okay, so I'll, I'll take it over here. Um, so what I'm going to show next is a is a is a is an application that we quickly built in uh, Daml and uh, hosted on Dabble. Uh, we'll get into how it works, uh, why we think it's cool, and so forth. And and afterwards, I'll actually jump into the code to show you that um, Beth wasn't making anything up. Uh, so the idea of the application here. And you know what? I will actually go ahead and share the URL of it because it's it's actually a a, a live working uh, application. Let me see if I can uh, actually do this on the chat. Here we go, chat. So I'll chat this after everybody. If you if you feel like logging on and accepting the uh, terms and conditions of uh, of uh, Project Dabble, uh, then uh, then feel free. So here we go. I have gone and pasted, it, uh, pasted the, the URL into the chat. Uh, and if you want to type back your, uh, your ledger ID, which is going to be on the upper right, that's the party that you get assigned. Um, I'll, if I have time, I'm going to go ahead and assign some funds to you. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, let me demonstrate what, uh, what this uh, treasury application uh, does. So the idea of it is that uh, within a financial institution or within a large business, uh, there is a unique treasury function who's, uh, uh, who's tasked with allocating funds in different currencies uh, to different desks or to different departments. And then those uh, uh, desks are able to, um, uh, to, to spend that money. Uh, so why don't you go ahead right now and uh, uh, Beth and and uh, let me know your um, ledger ID if you can. Maybe you can chat it in the in the box there. And what I'll do is I'll allocate some funds to her. Right now, I've only allocated uh, funds to uh, to one party so far. But I'll go ahead and give some money to Beth as well. Uh, so right now I'm logged in actually as the treasury and I'll go ahead and give some money to Beth here. Let's give her a million dollars with a wire limit of $20,000. And really the purpose of this application is it's, you know, um, is, is how efficiently and quickly we have built it expressing only the uh, business logic. Uh, so this, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm issuing some funds to Beth of a million dollars with a wire limit of $20,000. And we'll see if she tries to spend anything above that, uh, that it's going to get routed to a different workflow than it normally would be. Um, and then the purpose and the currency together uh, make that particular bit of funding unique um, so that, you know, she can have a, a different, different uh, uh, wire limits uh, for different purposes. 
Okay. Did you get the? Okay. Uh, so in the meanwhile, uh, while that's uh, while that's going through, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see the user side of of this funding here. So I'll go ahead and log on incognito as a different user. And uh, one of the one of the nice things about this app is that it's it's, it's actually live, uh, so which means it's actually using my uh, my credentials as I would be authenticated with uh, uh, Google or or something like that. If this were running on a different uh, ledger, um, then we would use the authentication uh, method of that ledger. So right now this is running on Project Dabble, which just uses a simple auth to, to authenticate users. Okay. So I've logged on here and uh, as, a, as an end user to the system, I have a different set of options of what I can do with uh, the funding. Uh, so I see the exact same bit of funding that I've allocated and I'm going to go ahead and uh, spend it. So as I said, if we go over the limit of 20,000, let's say I'm going to spend some $50,000. I'm going to send it to my mom uh, with the instructions, you know, I'll give her my, my Swift code. With a, with a note to the treasury saying, uh, you know, uh, So I'm gonna to try to go ahead and uh, send that money out. And what happens is in the background, uh, a wire request has been issued uh, with, with the same information uh, that, that we put in. That's because we were over the limit. So I can go ahead and approve this or, or reject this. Uh, so for the sake of the demo, I'll go ahead uh, and approve. And there we go, uh, the wire has been sent out. What this means is that this would have connected to the cash systems of the institution, uh, and this would have issued the, uh, the cash immediately. We could also potentially settle on any number of public blockchains here. Um, uh, so th this is in a way you can turn, um, you can view this uh, line here as kind of a digital token, the funding as a digital token, uh, but with the special properties that the issuer and the owner of the token can do all sorts of interesting uh, things with it. They can lend it from one desk to another. Um, you know, the, the treasury can could make some cuts if necessary, uh, highlighting the, the idea that um, the rights and obligations on, on such a token are usually a lot more complicated than merely owning or not owning uh, the token, which is usually what you get with a, with a public type token. Uh, okay, so um, that was, a, that was a short little demo of that. And uh, right now let's actually go ahead and jump into the underlying source code. Uh, there's more uh, features to this demo, but just conscious of time. And I do want to show you that uh, it's, it's not, a, uh, not very many lines of code. Okay, so I've gone, go ahead and uh, opened up the underlying demo. Uh, All together, you can see on the right here that it's about you know 230 lines of code and, and I'll show you the different features uh, that this uh, type of token or this type of smart contract would have. Uh, but first let's focus on what, what this funding means. Um, so hopefully uh, as, as I scroll through here you'll see that uh, there isn't any systems code here. So there isn't you know uh, a line of code that says you know this is, this is the way you should serialize a funding item and uh, display it to the owner, let's say. Uh, all of that sort of thing happens uh, automatically as you define your, your DAML and your multi-party workflow. Um, all right, so I focused in on a particular template called funding, uh, which describes how one of these tokens uh, or one of these smart contracts uh, work on a distributed ledger. Uh, so there's, there's different templates uh, within a DAML module, but templates in general describe the way, um, way these smart contracts behave and what data they 
have in them. Uh, so the first, the first things we notice is that this funding item contains uh, these data elements. There's an issuer, which is typically, let's say, the treasury. Uh, there's the owner, who's the holder of the token. You can think about that. There's an amount, a currency, the limit that we've uh, put in, as well as uh, the purpose. The funding purpose here is, is just, a, just a bit of text for now, but this is alluding to the fact that DAML is a, um, is a typed, type safe lambda calculus for the nerds out there. And uh, it means that uh, we are able to define very complex data structures uh, to, to put in our smart contracts. So it's not just you know, text, decimals, and, and what have you. Now, one of the unique types within DAML and we can think of this as kind of the special sauce of DAML, is uh, the party type. What this does is it abstracts away all of, the, all of the complications around being a participant in a multi-party system. Um, so this includes privacy. So there's a rule in DAML that says uh, you're not going to be disclosed a contract unless you're some sort of a stakeholder. And stakeholdership is also defined in a very specific way. Um, one, of the, uh, one, of, one concept in DAML of, of how to be a stakeholder is to be a signatory on a contract. And this means uh, that you're somehow obligeable uh, to perform on that contract. And there's a couple of axioms around rights and obligations within DAML that are always enforced. Uh, for example, you'll never be placed inside an obligeable position without your informed uh, consent. And the way you grant consent is by exercising choice. Uh, and this is completely just uh, consistent with international contract law that, you know, you can't ever be liable for something unless you consented to be liable for it. And uh, this, is, this is what this, uh, uh, this concept represents. Okay, so we went over the data items in here. Um, then there is uh, something called an invariable. It basically makes sure what does it take for this contract to remain sane. So you want the amounts and the wire limits to be greater than zero. Uh, lines 18 and 19 basically specify that uh, the purpose and the currency by issuer and owner uh, represent the key. So you can only have one contract uh, with uh, with these uh, uh, tetruplet or quadruplet uh, in um, on the ledger at once. Um, lastly, the choices, the things you can do with the funding, are defined as choices like this. So one of the things that we want with our token is uh, to be able to spend it, um, and this example here I've selected particularly because. Uh, one, it's, it's a relatively simple example, but it's still not like a hello world uh, level example that you, know, you, could, you could probably write in any language. It's, uh, it's actually kind of a realistic example of, of how one might model out uh, choices and obligations on, on a smart contract. So that's, that's why I've picked uh, this one. Um, so there's a, there's a few concepts in here, but I think I'll, I'll break them down for you and, and tell you why, why it matters. All right, so the owner is able to spend their token. That's what, that's what these two top lines mean. And nobody else can. So none of the other uh, parties on the funding token, including potentially the new owner of it or the recipient of a wire or the issuer in particular, they're, they're not gonna be able to spend somebody else's token. So that's what, that's what this controller owner means. Um, this part here is a somewhat sophisticated uh, statement saying that the spending of this token will result in new funding, the decreased funding, right? It's the decreased funds. And depending on whether the amount was over the limit or under the limit, it's also going to produce a wire or a wire request, right? So if it's over the limit, we're going to make a request to the treasury. If it's under the limit, the funding can go straight out uh, the door. Okay, so um, the rest of it, the, the thing after the do statement is actually specifying how, how we construct those items. Um, 
So here's the arguments to the choice. So, you know, if you want to spend your money, you need to say how much you want to spend. You want to, you need to specify a recipient, uh, set some settlement instructions and a note to the, to the treasury. Um, and what we do here, so first, the first thing we do is we draw down the funds. Um, so we basically create a copy of the current contract with a reduced amount. Uh, the second thing we do is just in memory, so not yet on the ledger, we construct the wire we would want. And all this is saying is, let's construct a wire where the funding is coming from the issuer, uh, the payer on the wire is the owner, uh, this is the amount, and inherit everything else like the currency, the settlement instructions, and the, and the recipient from either the argument or the, um, or the, or the contract items. And then here we have an if-else statement here that if the, if the spend amount is greater than the wire limit, well, then create the, uh, create the, um, create the wire lit request while we lock in place the funds uh, for, for, the, for the actual wire. So we actually escrow the, uh, the funds uh, within a, with a lock uh, so that, so that, you know, uh, the person can't issue multiple wires, let's say, and then the, the funding is still consumed, but it's not sent out the door yet without the treasury's, uh, consent. Otherwise, if the, if we're under the limit, then just go ahead and, and, uh, create the wire, uh, atomically. Okay. Uh, one thing to note is that all of the ledger actions that I've described, including decreasing the amount of the original funding, including creating the wire and the wire request are happening completely atomically. Uh, also implicit in here is that we actually destroy or archive the copy of the, uh, of the funding token um, that was on the ledger on which we exercised the choice uh, already. Um, and this archival and the two creations of these two contracts that we mentioned, so the the remaining funds and the, the wire or the, or the uh, wire request, all of that stuff happens atomically. So which means uh, you're protected against double spends. There's no way that you're going to, let's say, not archive the original funding and, and create the new funding uh, without, without all of the things uh, having happened. Um, yeah, so anytime you're, you're within a, a do block here, uh, you um, effectively all of the um, all of the actions happen completely uh, atomically. So this way you can compose choices as well. Um, and so as you can see, Daniel is really a way to describe what are the coherent state changes on a distributed ledger. Um, and note there's other other choices as, as that we defined as well. So for instance, the owner of the, of the token can transfer it internally. Um, they can receive uh, cash transfers internally. Uh, they can request more funds if they, if they want to. Um, and, and, but that's all they can do with the funding token. Uh, we also grant a number of rights to the issuer, which is not something you would traditionally see, with, see necessarily with, uh, with a traditional token. Um, so, for instance, the issuer can give more, they can change the limit, they can repurpose the, the funds, um, they can sweep two accounts together, uh, per, potentially with uh, different purposes into one single account. Uh, sadly, they can also cut funding so they can reduce the amount that's outstanding. Um, and they can also do some administrative tasks like uh, sweep and, and close accounts that have, uh, that have a zero amount in them. Um, so, so hopefully uh, this, this gives you the idea that this token is a, is a lot richer than, than you would totally get, uh, that you would get potentially with a public token. Uh, but note that, you know, I never did anything really, uh, technical or related to the, to the infrastructure in here. All I'm saying is what can parties do at what time with the data that they have access to? Um, speaking of which, uh, so we mentioned controllers and signatories as uh, being two uh, types of stakeholders. Uh, so you're only ever going to be disclosed a contract if you're one of those two types of stakeholders. Uh, there's a third type called an observer where you don't have, 
any liability or you don't have any choice on the contract, but you're able to see it. I don't think I've uh, used any of that here. Uh, within the same module, uh, there's a couple, few more templates that represent the state of things. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, except to say that um, what you do is you, you uh, hook these templates together to form your, your multi-party workflow. So the funding results in a funding request, and if the funding request is approved, it becomes more funding. So um, we also have the idea of a wire, a funds transfer, a wire request, which is the thing that goes to the treasury, which gives the uh, ability of the treasury to accept. Uh, and lastly, I've uh, entitled a particular user, um, and there could be multiple uh, such users to act as the act as the treasury. They're the only ones who are able to actually uh, issue funds. So the whole thing is about 230 lines, uh, zero infrastructure logic, 100% business logic uh, to, uh, to do what I've done. Um, lastly, on Project Dabble, if you want to run this entire thing, you want to deploy it somewhere, uh, but you don't want to worry about the infrastructure too much, then we offer uh, Project Dabble, where, uh, and, and this, is the, this is the back end of the UI that I've shown, uh, you upload two items. One is the DAR file, which is a compiled version of the DAML. It takes about like five seconds to, um, to compile together all of the DAML code. So this is, you see the funding template, the, um, the funding request and so forth. So it's, it's the same DAML code in the, in the background. And you can deploy a, a UI in front of it. In this case, this was written in React. Um, if you find the UI ugly, it's because I'm not a very good front-end developer, uh, but it's the, it's the built version of the, um, uh, the front-end interacting with the back-end via, um, via uh, TypeScript code that has been generated directly from the DAML, so you don't have to be serializing uh, uh, JSON files to, uh, to talk to the back-end. Now, when we say that DAML is uh, portable, what we mean is that uh, these two components and potentially some automations and triggers are the only things that are required to describe your business workflow. That means we can move these assets around potentially to a brand new ledger and without changing a single line of code, the, the front end will continue to work uh, exactly as it did either in Project Devil or on your own uh, personal uh, sandbox here. And so as soon as I've deployed the the zip file containing the front end, I get effectively the, the actual front end uh, that I've designed. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, I, think, I think I've uh, talked about everything that I wanted to show. Um, and I guess we turn it over for questions. Yes, we've had a few questions come in. Um, I think we'll just start off with somebody asked, what sort of knowledge or understanding would a developer need to have ahead of building with DAML and does digital asset offer support? Uh, so I can answer the first part and maybe uh, Beth, you answer the second one. Okay, so uh, to write DAML, uh, it, frank, frankly, we found that, um, <laughs> You know, anybody with uh, some functional programming experience can write DAML. Um, now, that could either mean that they're deeply steeped in the Haskells and Lisp-like languages of the world, but it could also mean that they've written a lot of Excel in their day, which is probably the most popular functional uh, programming language out there. Um, and in fact, we have found that kind of the most fruitful um, fruitful designs that we come up with in DAML are written by a combination of uh, somebody, somebody quite technical and somebody who knows the business really well. Uh, we found that uh, subject matter experts are particularly good at identifying who needs to sign off on what, which is, which is not really surprising because it corresponds to, to their subject matter expertise. On the support, you want to uh, talk about that, Beth? Absolutely. Uh, we offer a variety of different levels of support. Um, you know, I would urge anybody to either go to our website, digitalasset.com or daml.com. You can actually go there today, download the SDK and start building. 
Um, we have public Slack channels. Uh, you can email us directly. I'm just Beth at digitalasset.com and I can give you more details on anything you need to know. But we are, we are here as a resource, a resource to help people get up and running with their applications. You know, we, we want to see Daml being used and, and are here to help in whatever way, shape, or form that, that is. Excellent. Thank you. We had a few questions come in um, about interoperability. I'll start with this one. How easy is it to move your application over from one blockchain to another? Let me, I'll let you take that one. Yep. Um, so I made the, made the claim here that uh, once you write your demo and the integrations above it, that uh, you don't have to change a single line of, uh, of code. Um, and what that means is this treasury code will run atop uh, Corda, it'll run atop Hyperledger looking exactly the same. The, what we guarantee is the faithfulness of the, the Ledger API. And I don't, I don't know if it'll help to, to bring up the, the stack here. Um, yeah, so, so this is sort of the, the digital asset uh, stack in all its glory. And the DAML runtime is the thing which is hosting the DAR file. So that's where the DAML is being, uh, being run. Um, so anything above this line, which is above the DAML integration, will not have to change. Um, then what happens in the background is that these DAML integrations sort of work like uh, adapters to different, uh, to different blockchains. Uh, so um, you can think of it, and this analogy has a lot of holes in it, but you can kind of think of it as like a JDBC adapter, what these DAML integrations are. Uh, where the top, the, the SQL doesn't change, but the uh, the SQL doesn't change, but the underlying infrastructure uh, does. Um, the the reason that's uh, quite a bit loose is that um, what the demo runtimes tell, what the demo runtimes sends to the demo integration and back is is quite sophisticated. So it's it contains the payload for smart contract and disclosures and things like that. And we just we just think. Um interoperability and being able to run on different top, uh, different types of platforms is important because um, you know, requirements change, use cases change, and therefore the underlying infrastructure needs to change. So if you can um, achieve this without having to keep rewriting that application code, it makes it very powerful for uh, companies to start innovating today and not worrying about, um, you know, as their ch needs change tomorrow, do they have to completely rewrite that application? Um, so we, we see this as important for that reason and also because if you have think of large entities that have um, different areas and maybe running different asset classes on different infrastructures, you can start talking about interoperability there. That becomes very powerful um, as we start, sort of leverage uh, the benefits of these new technologies. Absolutely. That definitely seems like one of the core benefits of using DAML. Um, you touched on this in the beginning of your presentation um, that folks were using DAML to build decentralized applications across all sorts of industries. And someone asked, um, is it only appropriate for financial use cases? You know, yes or no. And then could you also give us an example of some of the applications being built? Uh, so it is not only appropriate for financial use cases. Um, you know, digital asset may be known for being uh, more centered around capital markets. You know, a lot of our clients, the Australian Securities Exchange, Hong Kong Exchange, and some of the banks around the world. But um, we also have clients in a variety of other areas, healthcare, supply chain, um, uh, retail. And, and we, we're, a lot of our partners that are building applications are looking across a wide variety of, of industries. Um, use cases range from, you know, collateral management in the financial space and derivatives processing, corporate actions to, you know, consumer KYC or supply chain tracking and logistics as it relates to the freight industry. Um, so there's a, a whole load of use cases that we're building on um, outside of financial services, um, a whole load of use cases that our partners are building on. Um, they can all be seen on downwell.com on the marketplace and, and you you know, on our website as well, there's a, a variety of different examples that we're doing directly with some of our clients. And kind of a, a fun addition to that, if you want to check out uh, projectdevil.com, 
Uh, there's a variety of sample apps that you can also deploy very quickly. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, one, how to work with DAML, how to work with uh, some of the various integrations. And um, uh, also, you know, they're, they're obviously for very different uh, use cases here. Uh, so there's a chat app here, so uh, which has a native interaction with Slack. Uh, there's uh, Devil Chess, which is uh, uh, particularly kind of a, a blockchain variant of chess where not everybody sees everything. And uh, the Open Work Board, which is sort of a sort of a Trello uh, clone, and in fact, uh, kind of the, one of the uh, one of the points of Dabble is that if you have some sort of an idea uh, for for a startup, um, and you don't exactly know what technology you need to be running on, but you know that you need some sort of multi-party technology, um, then consider you know describing your use case in Dabble and deploying it. Um, and, and basically let, let a, a service provide all of the infrastructure for you. So you can, so yeah, if you want to try these out, you can just quickly deploy them and, uh, and run them. Shifting gears slightly, we had someone ask about regulation. I think, uh, Levy, you pointed to this and um, the fact that DAML and the contracts that you built um, follow contract law. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the regulatory uh, constraints and thinking that went into building DAML and then um, what uh, folks building applications should be mindful of or, you know, are there um, regulatory constraints or limitations that, that, that folks are keeping in mind or should be mindful of? So I just want to say that I think, um, you know, there's a lot of great technologies out there and great companies that are building cool solutions, but um, not they're not always mindful of sort of some of the legal frameworks that exist, so then you kind of have to retroactively make that tech fit. Uh, so when we're thinking about any solution for our clients and, and building with DAML, uh, we always make sure that we are building within the confines of the regulatory frameworks. And we always have that guiding principle that um, new technology really should, ex uh, should support uh, existing legal frameworks um, that governs your know, business transactions and the exchange of value and, and really never supersede them. So, um, you know, we're very conscious to make sure that our solutions are, are in line with the legal frameworks and we spend a lot of time um, talking to law firms, we're traveling around the world, well, we're traveling around the world, speaking to a lot of uh, regulators and engaging with them, whether it's in Asia or Europe or the US. Um, so, you know, everything that we build is always with in mind of those regulatory principles. We think it's, it's very important. Excellent. Thank you. Just to close out here, I'd like to ask what's on the roadmap for the future. So there's a, there's, you know, we've, we've made some exciting announcements in the last couple of weeks. Um, and there's a lot more to come in the, the coming weeks. Um, we will be continuing adding things to dabble here um, and uh, a lot more dabble applications. Um, you know, the, the roadmap is exciting. We're very excited about what lies ahead. Um, you know, we're starting to see DAML come up in a variety of different areas outside of financial services. Um, so I think maybe just watch this space and see what's to come from us uh, and what we'll, we'll be announcing soon. We certainly will. And just to say, the recording of this presentation will be available so you can share it uh, with folks that weren't able to join live. But we'll also share the links, uh, the ones that Levi and uh, Beth mentioned, um, so that you can play around with it. Um, and also, I encourage you to visit uh, Digital Assets website, the news and blog section constantly has new, ro uh, new news rolling in about interesting projects, partnerships, and what's going on. Um, thank you, Beth and Lavi, so much for joining us. If you have any uh, final words, please. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's been great to present and, and uh, yeah, we look forward to what's next. I'm hopefully working with some of you. Yep, and th thank you very much. Excellent. We do too. Uh, we'll share the we'll share their contact information as well. So if you need to get in, uh, if you'd like to get in touch with Digital Asset and learn more, um, I know some of you asked about support. So that that is available, and we will uh, make sure to share those resources with you all. Thank you so much, and everyone have a great rest of your day.